Hello, and thank you to, for listening to this talk. What I want to do is discuss Hadrian's Wall, creating division. And I was very keen to start with one of these photographs of an iconic view of Hadrian's Wall, probably as we all imagine it in our mind's eye with the monument majestically caressing fantastic crags. Because this really shows the effort that the Roman army went to when it came to imposing this barrier on the landscape. So what I want to do over the course of this talk is look at what it was they were attempting to achieve by building this extraordinary monument. Now the title, Creating Division, probably gives a bit of a clue about what I think it's all about, but this harks back to the only surviving ancient Roman comment on what Hadrian's Wall was doing. An ancient document known as the Historia Augusta, which was probably written over 200 years after Hadrian's death in AD 138, tells us very succinctly that Hadrian was the first to build a wall 80 miles in length to separate the barbarians from the Romans. Now, taken at face value, that seems clear enough, but as the modern world reminds us, there are many different ways of imposing division on the landscape. Modern barriers, for example, can range, range from places where people have their identities checked, are searched, have any customs duties um, extracted from them, but are otherwise free more or less to move, right the way through to barriers which are genuinely designed as a major block on movement. So this raises the question of what kind of separation were they attempting to create on Hadrian's Wall? And there are really two general scholarly views on this today. One is that Hadrian's Wall did indeed serve to regulate the peaceful movement of people. The other sees Hadrian's Wall presenting a much more robust contribution to provincial defence, and this sees Hadrian's Wall as a military fortification capable of repulsing a full-blown barbarian army. So what was going on? The answer is not just of interest to modern scholars. It would have been playing on the minds of an awful lot of people living in the frontier zone when work on Hadrian's Wall got underway. Today, the archaeology of the local populations that have been living there for centuries is often overshadowed by the extraordinary Roman military remains. Here, for example, we see the remains of the stone walls and roundhouses that make up the local farmstead at Milking Gap. Up in the uplands, as with Milking Gap, we seem to see scattered farmsteads. As you descend into the lowlands, which were also divided by Hadrian's Wall, the evidence for local populations increases markedly. Some very important recent work on the Northumberland coastal plain by Tyne and Weir Archives and Museums has suggested that there was a pre-Roman population there of about 10 to 15,000 people living in a settled farming landscape that had developed over literally hundreds of years. And we must remember that these people wouldn't just be living and staying in their farmsteads. These populations would be underpinned by movement, be it movement to attend local markets, droving of livestock, movement of seasonal labour, or one-off journeys for things like marriage. And indeed, surely, movement to visit crucial ritual sites in the landscape as well. So creating, imposing a monument that would have a negative impact on movement could potentially have a serious impact on these local communities. So what did happen? Two ways we can perhaps try and get a sense of what Hadrian's Wall was all about is by looking at where it lies in the landscape and its design. In terms of its overall position, it crosses the Tyne Solway Isthmus, which is one of two places in Britain where the island narrows abruptly, making a shorter barrier viable. And this must be one of the key reasons why Hadrian's Wall was positioned in this location. But this is also a crucial part of Britain because it provides an unusually good natural cross-country corridor. That is really provided by two key river systems. Here in the east, we have the South Tyne, the North Tyne, joining to create the River Tyne, and over in the west, the Irthing and the Eden. These two river systems were connected just here 
in a narrow bottleneck of land only about 2.5 kilometers wide known as the Tipholt Irthing Gap. And here it is. Now in this area, not only do we have the connection between those east and west river systems, but we also have the only place on the isthmus where north-south travel was possible without having to make an important river crossing. So really this was a key natural junction for regional movement. If you could control this gap, you would be in a wonderful position to clamp down on movement in the region more generally. So if we look at the landscape, there seems to be signs that Hadrian's Wall is paying very close attention to the landscape as it lies in a position ideally suited to close off access to this natural east-west corridor from the north. The design of Hadrian's Wall though has often been taken to suggest that the nuances of the terrain are of very little significance to it. Here we see two versions of the wall, both during the Hadrianic period. A at the top shows the wall so far as we can tell as originally conceived, and B at the bottom after a major change of plan known as the Fort Decision. To start with the wall as it was originally conceived, what we see is a remarkably ordered system, which was based very much around a regular arbitrary subdivision of space. So these small little posts up here are known as mile castles. They're adapted versions of an installation known as a forklet. And as their name suggests, they were positioned at intervals of approximately 1,479 meters or one Roman mile. And what you can also see is that there are little gateways in them which lead through Hadrian's Wall and thereby allow passage through the frontier line itself. So if Hadrian's Wall was a means to just regulate the peaceful movement of people. This is where we should imagine local people moving through, filling out paperwork, being taxed, being searched and so forth. If by contrast, we're looking at a serious military barrier, then these mile castle gateways were probably intended primarily to ease north south movement for the military. Now between each pair of mile castles, we have two turrets again at fairly regular intervals, meaning that there was a manned Roman military installation approximately every 495 metres along the curtain. The curtain itself for most of the wall's length was originally a wide stone wall, although for part of it an even wider turf wall, and to the north a sizeable ditch was generally cut. So what we're looking at is a formidable barrier to movement, but one which was seemingly comparatively lightly manned, the mile castles probably had garrisons of not more than roughly 32 soldiers in them. But for some of the walls course, there were forts containing much larger numbers of soldiers set back from the line of the wall. And it looks as though there may have been some variations in mile castle and turret spacing to allow them to signal south to these major reinforcements. Inevitably, Taking a regular spacing system and imposing it on irregular terrain threw up some absurdities. Here are two examples, there are many more. We have Mile Castle 48 built on a one in five slope, and Mile Castle 35, which was seemingly not provided with a north gateway, and that would be because it lies directly south of a 30 meter vertical drop, which would mean that anyone who had tried to run north out of it would have had a very nasty surprise indeed. Now this reminds us that placing installations in this way is simply not standard Roman military practice. Generally speaking, they would site their locations so as to derive maximum advantage from their surroundings. So this is a most unusual arrangement. And it is also one that quickly proved to be unsatisfactory. So to return back to our schematic drawing, here we see how the plan for Hadrian's Wall was adjusted while construction was underway. This adjustment is generally referred to as the Fort Decision for the very good reason that the most visible and obvious change was the addition of a series of forts along the line of Hadrian's Wall. And to the south, an extraordinary earthwork known as the Vallon was constructed. 
This is generally about 36 meters wide. It consists of two earth mounds running parallel to an extraordinary ditch, which was about six meters wide and three meters deep. And it's worth remembering that this lies to the south of the wall in what is supposedly friendly territory. So you have a significant change of plan taking place while construction is underway. Here to look at some of those wall forts. And if we take the advantage of the example of Chester's down here, one of the curiosities about them is the way that they were built literally astride the curtain of Hadrian's Wall. So here's the curtain coming into about the midpoint of the fort and then to the north of it, in what we could think of as perhaps hostile territory, are three of the, the fort's main four gateways, which pres was presumably placed so as to allow rapid movement north from the fort. And here again, we seem to be seeing elements of regular placement. The forts are generally described as lying at intervals of about seven and a third to seven and two thirds Roman miles. But this seems to have been used in a much more flexible fashion than the spacing system for the mile castles and the turrets. Here we have the Valum at Caulfields, and as you can see, a really quite extraordinary earthwork barrier cutting through the countryside. And here, Chester's Fort in the North Tyne Valley, looking out of the East Gateway, and you can see how it really does dominate the valley of the North Tyne at this point. Now, this location was not arrived at by chance because Chester's only lies six Roman miles from its neighbouring fort to the east. So the spacing system has been a little bit adjusted to put the fort right in the line of the valley. Now, you see something similar with the Tipold Irthing Gap, that key natural junction in the landscape, where you have forts on its east and west flanks, but only at distances of three and one third Roman miles. So it looks as though these key locations in the country, these places where movement is likely to have been concentrated, received special attention. And one of the great things about the overall plan of Hadrian's Wall is that because it's predictable, we can see where it departs from the usual plan, where the Roman army elected to do something a little bit unusual. So here, a series of different kinds of anomaly have been superimposed onto a single plan. These anomalies include mile castles that seem to have been built early, mile castles that were unusually large, extra turrets, unusually close forts, unusually large forts, unusually small forts, mile castles with causeways over the ditch. And what you can see from this is that there's a real concentration of anomalies just here, which is in and around the Tipot Irthing Gap. So it looks as though the Roman military are departing from what was the normal blueprint in order to achieve tighter control of the landscape at this point. In other words, an ability to clamp down on movement seems to be key to what they're trying to achieve. And one such anomaly, although this one not in the Tipot Irthing Gap, should give us a sense of scale as well. Here we see a very unusual third tower in a wall mile. It was constructed at Peel Gap. It was built after the wall here, after construction of the wall here was underway, and it blocks a blind spot where people could approach and cross the wall unobserved from either of the neighboring turrets. Now, they could of course have built anything they wanted to here. It didn't have to be a turret, it could have been another mile castle or even a fort once they decided to break with the spacing system. So the decision to go with a tower, the smallest option available to them, suggests that they are really trying to look at ways to minimize opportunities for low level infiltration. This would be no good at all against an invading army, for example. But it does mean that we're left in a position where we seem to have a barrier that is unduly formidable to try and regulate peaceful movement of people, but also not ideally designed to try and block movement by hostile armies. So what is it that's going on? What is it all about? One possibility is another form of warfare, which is attested in Roman Britain and particularly in Wales and Scotland. 
And this is what would now be referred to as an insurgency or guerrilla warfare. We see clear indications of this in the ancient literature in Wales, where, among other groups, the Silures seem to have frustrated Roman attempts at conquest for a quarter of a century or so. And here, the Roman military has imposed a web of posts, including not just forts, but also smaller fortlets in between them. And this, intriguingly, seems to match later 19th century approaches to counterinsurgency or defeating guerrilla warfare, as outlined by a British officer, Colonel C.E. Caldwell. And there he advocates using chains, networks of larger and smaller posts as your best bet for victory in guerrilla warfare. Scotland, another place where we have good evidence for guerrilla warfare being played out. And here we not only see this pattern of forts and fortlets replicated, but at a place known as the Gask Ridge, we see a notable increase in the level of military control. And that's by adding a series of towers to the system as well. And it has long been noticed that the Gask Ridge could serve as a precursor to the late, later and great artificial frontiers, where you have the basic concept of forts, fortlets and towers arranged in relation to a linear feature. Here it's the Gask Ridge Road and later of course on Hadrian's Wall it's the Curtain Wall itself. So if we are seeing elements of Roman counterinsurgency strategies in Wales and Scotland, exactly the locations where the ancient historians would suggest that such conflict was concentrated, it is possible that we are seeing feeding into the design of Hadrian's Wall these counterinsurgency strategies. So what about the background to the construction of Hadrian's Wall? There's plenty of cause to believe that there were problems in Britain at around the time construction started. The Historia Augusta tells us that the, the Britons could not be kept under Roman control at the beginning of Hadrian's reign. And we know that an Expeditio Britannica, that is a military task force, was dispatched to Britain at some point in Hadrian's reign with the year AD 122, around the time that work started on the wall, seeming the most likely candidate. And a reconstructed text from a Roman inscription found reused at Jarrow also suggests that the origins of Hadrian's Wall lie in the aftermath of conflict. It tells us that after the barbarians had been dispersed and the province of Britain had been recovered, he, presumably Hadrian, added a frontier line between either shore of the ocean for 80 miles. The use of the word dispersed is interesting as well, because that suggests an enemy that was hard to bring to battle and defeat decisively. And that is a key feature of guerrilla warfare. It depends very much on what you think of as hit and run attacks, whereby less well-resourced opponents try to defeat regular armies by springing surprise attacks and then escaping before the more the regular army can concentrate its forces and use its advantages in technology, numbers, equipment, etc., to defeat the attackers. So if we think about Hadrian's Wall in relation to guerrilla warfare, it's very possible that both of the versions, A and B, before and after the fort decision, can be interpreted as a way or as an element of a counterinsurgency strategy. If the problem was small bands striking and then escaping, then Hadrian's Wall in the A scheme before the fort decision would be able to use the regular sequence of mile castles and turrets as a way to minimize the opportunity for groups to sneak across the frontier in either direction. This would mean that any resistance groups operating to the south would be cut off from any northern safe havens or indeed northern support in terms of men or equipment. And indeed, the alterations to Hadrian's Wall, the fort decision itself, seems best explained as a significant change in the prevailing military situation. The forts would have, control, would have contained approximately 9,090 soldiers, so a significant increase in the number of soldiers along the wall line, while the Vallum itself 
would be very good at minimizing the opportunities for ambushes to be sprung from the south. Positioning the forts astride the wall could be seen as another counterinsurgency cliche, whereby regular armies seek to diminish the advantage of surprise by increasing their response time. So we could imagine cavalry forces charging north as quickly as possible out of these forts to try and engage elusive enemies before they have a chance to vanish. That cavalry units were indeed hunting down barbarian groups in the vicinity of Hadrian's Wall is confirmed by an altar inscription, which probably originally stood at Chester's Fort, which tells us that a prefect of cavalry fulfilled his vow to the god after slaughtering a band of Coriolanotai. So we can see that cavalry are indeed engaging mobile opponents. So what was the impact of Hadrian's Wall on the local population? Those excavations on the Northumberland coastal plain indicate that at least some local settlements were abandoned at around the time that Hadrian's Wall became operational. So it does indeed seem to have had a significant impact on local groups living to the north of the wall. What is potentially even more interesting though is that modern counterinsurgency literature talks very much about attempting to find a political solution that addresses the initial local grievance that started the fighting in the first place. In that regard, it is very interesting that there are signs that resistance to the south of the wall decreased in the late second or early third century, which is at exactly around the time that a local town was founded at Carlisle and perhaps also Corbridge, thereby restoring a measure of autonomy to local groups. So it's just possible that we can take all of these different threads of evidence and bring them together to suggest that Hadrian's Wall was conceived as an element of a counterinsurgency strategy. Thank you for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed this talk. If you have, it is one of many subjects explored in my new book, published by Bloomsbury Academic, where I try to take a fresh look at the frontier. So if you enjoyed this, please do consider giving the book a look as well. Thank you for listening. Bye bye.